Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. Welcome to Life Support. So glad to have you here. We are at the Waymaker World Conference in Orlando, Florida, sponsored by the American Association of Christian Counselors. And this is great because we're surrounded by thousands of counselors that are really called to bring you closer to Christ. And that's what trauma does. And that's why we do this program. We have a very special show for you. Lee Bailey Sealer of Five Stone Media caught up with the legendary Josh McDowell. We want you to hear this. It's fantastic. So enjoy Lee and Josh. Well, we have a treat today for our listeners and for me. Um, we get to talk to Josh McDowell, and welcome to Life Support, Josh. Well, thank you. Boy, my wife would like to sit there and talk to me today. I've been away from home too long. Have you? Oh, I'm sorry. Four days. That's a lot for oh. me. Um, good, uh, but you're, you're speaking today. We're at the uh, Waymaker Conference, the sponsored by AACC in Orlando, Florida, and um, I've got a number of things I could talk to you about. Um, well, far away. You have a lot of uh, a great experience and um, can speak into the lives of, of our listeners. But um, maybe we should start with, you've got a new book uh, with uh, Ben Bennett, uh, Free to Thrive. Tell us about the book. What's the book? Well, over the years, my heart's been broken so many times when Christian leaders, influencers, would crash morally with affairs or something like we recently had. Mm -hmm. And it just hurt. And so over the years, I've called them. And ask him, hey, what's going on? What happened? What? And you know what I found? That in the overwhelming majority, there was unhealed hurts and unmet longings in her life. And I think I've come to the conclusion, if there's unmet longings, it'll affect bad behavior. If there's unmet hurts, you'll live them out in relationships. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that was true in my life. And um, so I teamed up with Ben Bennett because he's a staff member of mine, works for me, with me. And uh, he has a very similar story. It's a different story, but the same principles. And so we kind of end up together. You know, there's so many people out there like us. Let's write a book together that will help to heal the hurts and to meet the unmet longings in a person's life so that they can be free to totally thrive in our walk with Christ. So that's how the book came about, why it's called Free to Thrive. Great. And and I'm just going to say personally, the book has been real helpful for me too. Uh, if anyone is out there who's hurting, um, who, who thinks that they've got some behavior they have to um, change, get beyond, um, if they're striving and maybe they don't know why they're striving for something, I'm going to say the book helped me to understand some things about my past that I, I never realized. I'm almost 60 years old, and and it, I, I've learned some new things about myself this year. It's it's a really really helpful book. You know, so, we all have hurts. Yeah. The healthiest people have hurts, and for years, I didn't understand what was happening in my life. For years that I didn't know it tied up in the situation with my father. And finally, I got back to the situation with my father and healed that. And wow, did it affect my life. Uh, but I think reading this book, I want two things to happen. First, people will see, boy, God's done a lot in my life. A lot's been done. And then to see or sense, you know, there's some more things he wants to do. And I outline it. And I think the book will help to surface some of the hurts. I'm not the one that says, now you just go out and you start praying, you start thinking, now what are the hurts am I? No, let God show them to you. Mm -hmm. But you gotta be willing to listen. Right. That's fantastic. Um, the, uh, as I was reading the book, I was thinking of, uh, of course, my past. And, but uh, it occurred to me, someone who's, who's close to me in my life um, is at a point where um, they think that that they're beyond help, that they've given up on longing um, because they've, they've tried for so long, maybe 
to find to answer their longing in an unhealthy way that it hasn't worked and they need not to get finding this book. satisfaction. They need to get this book. Yeah. Um, talk about um, the, the difference between meeting our longings in a healthy way and an unhealthy way and where God fits into that. As I think a lot of people maybe feel like, well, I'm being self-centered. I'm being selfish if I want this for my life. For instance, acceptance. We, we all want to be accepted by others. And a lot of people, I think, will look at that as an unhealthy thing. Um, I'm, I shouldn't be worried so much about myself. I should concentrate on others. What, what is the difference in God's eyes between us finding our longings in a healthy way? Um, well, just a simple example, and I say the number one thing that men especially, many women, but men especially turn to for hurts and longings is pornography. Mm-hmm. Is pornography. For, for a number of reasons. One of the biggest reasons is they feel that the porn actress accepts me mm-hmm. just the way I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they'll go into porn. Most people that watch porn are meeting unfulfilled longings or hurts in an inappropriate way. And... Uh, this is why I think the book will help you to see what is right. what is a godly way, an appropriate way to meet these desires and not. But usually, we need another person in our life. Most of our problems start with people. Most of the healing starts with people. Problems start with hurting relationships, wrong relationships. Mm-hmm. Healing starts with the right relationships. Mm-hmm. We need other people in our lives. Um, one of the, the quotes out of the book that I love so much, I'm putting it on my office wall, is uh, that human aloneness was a crisis that God took extraordinary steps to remedy. Um, I think that, uh, particularly as you say for guys, but for, for all of us, when we get into a place in life that's uncomfortable or that we're ashamed of, we isolate. We don't want people to see us. You know, we don't, we don't want people to see us as weak or, or flawed or that we're not succeeding. Um, and so we tend to isolate. I know that was true in my life and I have a history of addiction. And, and when I was in my active addiction, I was isolated because I, I just couldn't do a relationship. It wasn't in me. Um, I had no self-worth. Um, talk about, and particularly lately, the, of course, the last year and a half, um, we've been isolated in a new way, um, sort of self-imposed, but um, for some people, it, absolutely necessary. So talk about um, the way isolation feeds into uh, just reinforcing those negative, unhealthy ways of, of meeting longings. Is When we isolate ourselves, we cut ourselves off from people. And when we cut ourselves off from people, We cut ourselves off from ministry in our lives. I think every one of us as men and every woman should be in a, I like to call them care groups, small groups, with other women or with men, uh, if you're a man, that is very honest and open. Because if you don't have people around you that love you enough to confront you, you almost always turn to unhealthy behavior. Uh, and today, as I said before, and I'll say it again, usually they turn to porn. Mm-hmm. They'll turn to porn. 90, 91.5% of men in the last month have watched porn. Mm-hmm. 60% of women. And that's huge. It's hard to believe. That's, it's amazing. Uh, that. And um, what it means is there's a lot of un unmet hurts and longings in a person's life. And so it's, we would try, one way we try to do it is by start to live a performance life. We have to perform to be accepted mm-hmm. and not accepted for who we are in our very basic nature and, right. and um, our, our character. We start to perform. And when you start to perform, you usually become more and more lonely as a result of it. Mm -hmm. And I don't so how a person will live a performance life. I don't know how they can ever have the joy of Christ in their life. 
because you always have a fear you're not doing enough to be accepted. Uh, we need to realize that we need to be accepted for who we are, not what we do. Now, what we do should magnify who we are. Uh, what we do, you should be able to see on the outside who we are on the inside. And um, one of the steps here is to, what is your perspective of God? Uh, I wrote a book called See Yourself as God Sees You because we need to see who God is and that he has the capacity to love us totally unconditionally for who we are with our faults. And once I realize that God accepts me the way I am with my faults, I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I ought to be. But by God's grace, I'm not who I'm going to be. But God wants me to enjoy that process, that journey with him. And once I see who God is, now he accepts me unconditionally. And then I'm able to accept myself unconditionally. Then you're normally free to be real with other people. Until you can accept yourself the way you are and uh, thrive to be free from it, you cannot trust others to accept you the way you are. And you become a double-faced person. Uh, people see one thing on the outside when you're struggling with another thing on the inside. So that, that brings up one of the things that, that we are at Life Support is we are for the church and for ministry uh -huh. leaders. Um, what you just talked about, appearing to be who we are on the outside, the same as who we are on the inside. Why do you think it is that there's such a problem in the church with ministry leaders who, who are afraid to show who they are on the inside? Um, and what can you speak into their lives about transparency and being honest and open with their struggles? I would say one, even though you're a pastor, a staff member, whatever, you don't see how God sees you. You're ignorant. Um, until we see who God is in his very nature and then see how does God perceive me, uh, you will always be covering it up as a leader, whatever. And leaders have as much problems as, as, quote, followers. I just like to say influencers have as much problems. Pastors are people. This is why pastors need accountability. The board should hold pastors accountable. They should build a relationship with the pastor, know the pastor, share with the pastor. Uh, because most pastors feel they have to go it alone. And you might as well go sell used cars if you feel that way. Pastors need people they trust in their lives. Because if you don't have people who trust in your lives, you're not going to have people who are honest with you. And I know in my life, I need others. I need my wife, my kids, my closest, dearest friends like Ward Coleman and others. I need them to see who I am on the inside. They're honest with me and everything. And without that, you cannot thrive. And uh, so you need to see who God is, how he accepts you, that it can lead to you accepting yourself. Once you can accept yourself, then you can trust others to accept you the way you are and be authentic. Yeah. Not cover up, not be a fake, not live two lives, be authentic. And, and leaders in an organization, whatever it is, even a church or, or whatever, um, when that happens in a leader's life, it becomes systemic, right? Um, it, it gets transmitted to everybody. Everybody sees that it's okay. And um, they know that who, who I am on the inside is I'm is not okay. sure everybody sees they're okay because most pastors and leaders are personality A, like I am. And personality A can cover up. Personality A has a capacity to, that's one of the downsides of personality, has a, has a capacity to fool people, to cover up your hurts and all. And uh, so I don't think most people see it. It's almost where that person has to come to a crisis in their life, where they're saying, I need help. 
until you get that sense of, I need help, mm -hmm. no one can help you. Mm -hmm. And so often you need to come to that crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, and this is what happened in my life. Uh, I just knew there was something wrong here. I was out running a global ministry, seeing, I mean, literally affecting millions, mm -hmm. seeing hundreds of thousands come to Christ. I mean, 150 some books out, uh, being listened to by people all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful for that. But at the same time, I said, I got a problem. And here's the thing, I didn't know what it was. And one time I got home and I called a friend of mine, Dr. Henry Cloud. And I said, Henry, there's a problem in Camelot. I kind of had a Camelot ministry, very successful, everything, but there was a problem. And I said, I need a coach. You know, I think maybe because of my pride, I didn't say I need a counselor. <laughs> I, I kind of covered up a little, and Henry probably knew it. But I said, Henry, I need a coach. I need help. And for about a year, year and a half, every trip I made home, I went up and spent an hour, hour and a half with Henry. And uh, for the first half of the year, I think, he mainly just listened to me. He would ask a question and just listen. And then he started to speak into some of the hurts in my life with scripture and all. And uh, got down to what, and it was something I never dreamed was a part of my life. It got down to what it is and a phrase that my father had told me. When I was young, I was about maybe nine, 10, maybe most 11 years old. We're walking out to, the, I still remember the place I was standing everywhere. And he said, you know, you were an unwanted child. We really didn't want you. And the only good you're for is to work the fields. Now, my father had been drinking. If he was sober, he never would have said that. But he'd been drinking. That staggered me. And you know, that affects me to this day. I can still feel that emotion when I think about it, everything. And Henry helped me to walk through that. Uh, and I felt like I always had to perform to please people. I had to perform to be accepted by my dad. Now, isn't that amazing? A dumb, stupid statement by my father has affected me for 82 years. Well, since I was six, uh, 75 years. I'm 82 years old. I don't feel like it, but I am. Uh, and it affects me to this day. That's how powerful dads are, especially in a child's life. Uh, and so... I couldn't discover that myself. I needed help. Mm -hmm. And I, I say to so many people, you need counseling. More than going to church and having a counselor at the church talk to you. Most counselors at churches are wonderful, but they're not trained. Uh, they can hold your hand, share some scripture with you, and that's about it. And I'll tell people, you need professional counsel, which will cost you some money. Mm -hmm. Cost me a lot of money. It was the best money I ever spent. But I needed someone like Henry Cloud. And another man that really helped me, oh, and was a dear friend, Bob Beale. I don't know if you ever heard of the name Bob Beale. He lives in Orlando. and That's where we are right now, we're isn't it? Yeah. Yes, it is. He lives here. And he's a executive counselor, consultant for corporations. Oh, does that man have wisdom. Oh, my gosh. He helped me so much uh, that... Uh, he and Henry Cloud, and then my wife. Ah, <laughs> I often say when my wife married me, she took on a whole lot of problems. I mean, a whole lot of shortcomings. And I never knew a woman could love a man as much as Dottie loves me. It's supernatural. My wife has changed my life as much, if not more, than Jesus has. Hmm. By the way she loves me. Her wise counsel, uh, she'll point out something in my life. Now, when she does it, I kind of resent it. Deep down in, Argh! but I'm always thankful. Uh, and so those three people, huh. Henry Cloud, Bob Beal, and my wife, Dottie. Yeah. Without them, I wouldn't be sitting here being interviewed by you. It's so important to have a team, isn't it? Unless you were interviewing homeless people. No. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um... I, I, we don't have a, a whole lot of time left, five minutes or so, but I, I think it would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Boy, if you this. don't have much to say, five I've minutes is a long it's time. It's a long time. <laughs> I've, got, uh, I've got to ask you about young people a little bit. Um, 
you've been around, as you say, for uh, quite a while, and you've been in ministry for a long time, um, and uh, around youth for, for a long time. Almost my whole life. Yeah. Um, talk about um, what it's like for, for young people today. It, the world is so challenging for all of us, but for yeah. young people, it's really different, I think. The world is always challenging, and the world is always challenging for young people. Uh, every generation, I think, it's harder to raise kids now than they used to be. Every parent feels that way. But I would say it might well be true today. Why? Because of the cell phone. Most young people are growing up connecting with their friends but not relating with their friends. And when you just connect with people, you start to have a lot of negative behavior in your life and feelings and thoughts. Um, and that's why one of the top five epidemics in, ev now this is important, every culture of the world, every country, and it wasn't started by uh, um, COVID. It was magnified and enhanced by COVID. Is this loneliness. It was here before COVID. And believe me, it's going to be here after COVID. But COVID has magnified it and, and enhanced it. But most kids, I would say... 90% of young people today are lonely because they're only connecting, they're not relating because of the cell phone. And uh, this is where parents come in. If ever a child has needed a loving, intimate, close relationship with their daddy mm -hmm. is right now in life. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe right now the most powerful person in a child's life is their father. Now, I don't want to take from moms. See, here's the problem. Moms are usually not the problem. They're usually doing it right or trying hard to. It's the man that's often not even trying and doesn't know how to be a father, relate to a child or anything. Uh, and so dads are one of the most powerful. And when you have a child who has a loving, close, intimate, meaning no barriers, relationship with their father, you very seldom ever find them in trouble, poor behavior, whatever, uh, and if they have it intellectually, they'll be flourishing at school related because of their dad. Dads have such power. Uh, and this is why churches need to have one of their two or three reasons for existence to help fathers grow. Not mothers so much. Moms are doing it right. <laughs> Moms have something from God that the rest of us men don't have, I think. In, uh, a good intuition, everything. Yeah. But churches must build men in to be good lovers, good relational people. Uh, they need to see the importance they are to a child and all. And I'll tell you this, if they don't get that from their church, they won't get it probably in life. Mm. Yeah. Mm, that's important. Um, what, what about the... You know, in terms of student ministry, we, we have student ministry leaders who are part of our world and our listeners. Uh, what can they do beyond the family when a kid shows up on Wednesday night or whatever it is? Um, what, can, what can ministry leaders do to shepherd young people well today? Very simple. Listen to them. Listen to them. I think if I was a youth leader, I would constantly have feedback and interaction mm -hmm. with the small groups. Mm -hmm. Second, if somebody new showed up on a Wednesday night, I would try right then to have five, eight, ten minutes with that child mm -hmm. and just listen to them, ask questions. Don't think about ministering to them. You're ministering to them by listening to them or make an appointment with them. Go out to McDonald's or something, Starbucks, whatever, and listen. Mm -hmm. Listen. Uh, listening is one of the mo most powerful uh, remedies to loneliness, to depression, to anxiety, everything, mm -hmm. is that somebody sits there and listens to you. And I say, be proactive, ask questions about, about knowledge in this sense. 
ask questions. Well, when did that happen? How old were you then? Uh, who was it that said that to you? Well, how did you respond to that? Well, did that hurt when you did? Asking questions to bring more of the truth out of the person to listen to them. That's the best thing a youth pastor can do. Got it. Um, and we're not, we're not great at listening. Um. And then I would say this. Every, if I was a youth pastor, I would try to have an adult in the church as a mentor of that child. Every child in the youth group should have an adult playing a role in their life, especially if their father doesn't do it at home. Well, power of dads. Uh, yep, yeah, power of dads. It's an important thing, um, and we couldn't talk about it enough. And I'm afraid we have run out of time. Boy, that ten minutes went by <laughs> fast. <laughs> no. The book is "Free to Thrive." Josh McDowell and Ben Bennett. And um, Josh, thank you so much for your words today. Thanks. Hey, for joining well, thank us. you. What a privilege to be on the program with you.